appreciate Hannah is going to walk the, the mic around. So uh, if you have comments and stuff, raise your hand and Hannah will come by with the microphone. So the people at home can, can listen in as well. Uh, we're going to go through the, the last questions then of uh, lesson 43 and then go into 44. Before we go into the questions, was there anything left that anyone had as far as comments on on 43, this last part? Okay, so let's go to question number nine. It says, what happens after the tribulation? That's six. Go on down. One more. So what uh, what will pass away and what will remain? In Matthew 35, or verse 35 of Matthew 24, we find heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So we find that even though all is destroyed, uh, and whether that's talking about Jerusalem uh, and, and sticking with, with this, or whether it's talking about the second coming, uh, it looks like to me it would be rather probably Jerusalem here because... Regardless, the word of God is going to remain. Man can do whatever he wants. He can destroy everything that he wants, but God's word is going to remain. And that's what we have to understand as people, that God's word is, is forever. And, you know, nothing that man says, nothing that man can do can change that. And so uh, just as when we talked about the, the Mount of Transfiguration, God said, this is Jesus, my son, listen to him. Uh, question number 11, uh, what, when date, when date, what date, or what era, okay, what date, or era did, okay, I, okay, I, I skipped ahead. What era did Jesus compare this time to? What time in history did, did he compare this to? The time of Noah. And what did he talk about with the time of Noah? Anybody? Go ahead. Okay, no one knew what day it was going to happen, but what, what happened in the day of Noah? The flood came, but there were people marrying. There were people carrying on what they, they normally did that day. They had no idea. So they, there were people out in the fields. There were people uh, having, having a party. There were people doing whatever they normally did that day. And when it came, it came. And there was no warning, as, as you said. So, The whole point is not that there's no warning. It's right. that they didn't listen to the warning and they continued to do as if everything was going to go on as it's always gone on. Just like in the days of Noah, that's what these days are going to be like. But what? Okay, so so they've been, how long were they warned? The, the top. Told all kind of warning. And right in the days of Noah, though. Well, uh -huh. they had they had the preaching of Noah. He gave the prophecies of God. Regarding... And how long did that last? Well, depending on when you heard it, any time up to hundred years before the flood. Okay. Huh. So we should listen, regardless whether it's a hundred years or thirty-seven, forty years here with Jerusalem. But what do what do people tend to do? They hear the warning and they say, well, that's not for me. Or they ignore it or they don't care. I mean, there's all kind of reasons why people don't uh, give heed to the gospel call. Um, they think they've got time. They think they've got years ahead of them to, to decide whether or not to respond to it. And all warnings are warnings for a reason. And that was, that was Jesus' whole point. I can talk to you to you I'm blue in the face. The the prophets can talk to you to they're blue in the face. And some of you are going to respond positively and some of you are going to ignore. So what and I and I'm throwing some other questions out that's not on here. So what what does the world typically say about 
why they are not responding to Christ. And I know that's kind of a generic question, but how long has it been since Christ was here? A couple thousand, almost 2,000 years now, right? About 1,990 years. And so if Christ hasn't come yet, is he going to come? In Second Peter, they said the Lord is slack concerning his promise. I mean, the idea is either it's not going to happen in my lifetime, so I don't really have to worry about it too much, or it's never going to happen. And it's been 2,000, 2000 years since he, since he promised, so he must not be coming. And so, I mean, people in Noah's day did that. Yeah, Noah, you've been talking about this flood for however long you've been talking about it, how long they've been hearing it. It's clearly not coming. I mean, you, you, you don't know what you're talking about. And so they were going on about life as though it was just going to be a normal day. And I mean, part of Jesus' point, I mean, there are signs leading up and there are warnings and all that. But you don't know what day it's coming. You don't know what day the flood's going to start. And when it starts, it's too late. Yeah. I mean, because Noah and his family, by the time the flood actually began, had been shut up in the ark for a week. That door was shut. The door was, was shut not and it wasn't open. opening again. So there was no chance. And that's kind of the point of the parables that are going to follow. Yeah. When the door's shut, you can't come in. Once, once, the, once the judgment is upon you, it's too late. Now is the time to prepare. And so they, they, didn't, they didn't do it in Noah's day. They're not going to do it for the destruction of Jerusalem. And there are going to be people who don't do it for, for the their own judgment. They're, they're not going to be ready. And right. They delay for whatever reason. And it is this that Christ is judgment is as certain as the judgment on Jerusalem. It is as certain as the judgment of the king of Israel. It's not going to change. Right. And God is not going to change his mind. And, and the day is already set. It is. It is set. Whether it's, whether it's, this afternoon, or whether it's a week from now, or whether it's 200 years from now, or 2,000 years from now, it's set. Dale? I have a good example later, but a couple of thousand years since Noah, Felix said the same thing. When, he, when Paul was talking to him about his soul, he, and he said, when I have another time, I will call on you. He wanted to hear more but not right at that moment. And we don't know if that other time ever came. Don't know. We have Joyce back there. It may be that some people have heard through their lifetime that Jesus is such a loving God that he's not really going to do these horrible things because he loves us all too much, and they cling to that. That's true. But what does history say? What do, I mean, we have Old Testament, and although we we don't we're not under the law of the Old Testament. The Old Testament there's for a purpose, and we do have an example of how God deals with those who are not not following the law. I know that. That's enough for them if they've heard that and they believe it because it's easier. And that's basically why they, they said, you know, if somebody claims to be Christ, if someone says that Christ is over here or over there, don't believe it. Don't believe it. Okay, any other comments? There was warnings. There was warnings up to this. But when, when, when the time came, people were surprised. It was like a thief coming in. They, they did not know the exact time or date that that was going to happen. Um, which kind of answers uh, Matthew 36. Uh, what date did Jesus say the, that this would all take place? He didn't. Um, who are the wise and evil servants? First, who, who are the wise servants that, that Jesus was talking about? 
When that time came, what would the wise servants be doing? Okay, they were doing the things that, that they were set to do. What about the evil servants? Who are they? Get, get the mic over to Audra there. <laughs> Those who were not willing to obey and to uh, be faithful and, and had no concerns. And what did these evil servants actually go and do? Zealot servants. Yeah, they, they beat the ones that they were left in charge of. And so they were not good servants as far as uh, that their master was. And so they, they began to, uh, you heard the, the term that uh, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely or something like that. I mean, so, sometimes when people are placed in charge, they may have been good servants doing uh, the, the job that they were given, but when they get to be in charge, it, it's like the lessons that they learned from their master completely went out the door. So, <clears throat> uh, again, we need to be doing the thing. God needs to find us when, when that day comes uh, for, for, for the judgment that's, that's going to be happening. Whether, whether God judges Indiana or the United States or when it comes to the final judgment, when God returns, he needs to find us doing the things that we should be doing as a Christian. If not, we're that evil servant. So um, here you've got the good servant that can later be called the sheep and the evil servant being later called the goat. Um, what is the end result for the evil servant when the master returns? So it's not going to be good. Uh, they'll cut him asunder, uh, point his portion uh, with the hypocrites and the weeping and gnashing of teeth, which if you've ever been in pain without any type of sedative, you're gnashing your teeth together to, with that pain. <clears throat> okay, so we are going into lesson 44. And the first part is the householder. If somebody would read Mark 13 and verse 34. Raise your hand and Hannah will come by with the microphone. Mark 13 and verse 34. Okay, Gail. <clears throat> Actually, get it is like a man away on a journey who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Okay. Actually, go ahead and get Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, and you can read that after we discuss this. So the householder, what, what is the point? of this parable here i mean it's a very short verse it's not very long what is what is the whole point of of this saying here gail what is it we just studied it's time for them to begin to be aware their their master is going to come back they don't know when but they are to be on their toes and be ready for him whenever he comes. You know, Christ talked about <clears throat> uh, the the church or the members of the church being like an army, and he uses very, very um, various things to talk about the military, and especially during this time when the military was out and they would camp. What did they do? Did everybody sleep? They had a guard. They had somebody on, 
many people on watch and they would switch people around so everybody could get some rest. And even today, uh, on a Navy base, on Army posts, wherever you have people in four-hour watches that stand up at night and keep watch. During the day when you were marching, did, was the whole Army together just marching? You had people out in front. You had people taking a look to see what was ahead of the Army and, and, and uh, sending information back so that the army would not get, hopefully not get surprised or ambushed or, or something like that. So uh, here again, while the, the, the master is away, the people are not supposed to just sit back and do whatever they want. They need to be watching for the master to see when he is coming back and to make sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Be watchful. How, how does that apply to us today? Does this apply to us today? Should that be what we're doing? Should we not be watchful to see when he's coming back? Gail? What a pleasant thing to be a guard on site. I stood, I stood watch <laughs> in the harbor of Boston, midnight shift in the middle of winter, and it was cold as it could be. And that little pea coat that I had on wasn't nearly enough. I had other clothing on, but I'll tell you, that was the loneliest job anyone could ever have. And when my, turn, my time was over with, I was thankful to God that I got out of there. <laughs> it was. It, I, I stood watch at the pier at Yorktown, and I'll tell you what, it may have only been 30 degrees out, but that, with the moisture in the air, with the wind blowing off, it bit you. It bit you. And it, watch, watching the midnight, from midnight or even the, the, the last watch, the, from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock, watching that sun come up, you get so sleepy. <laughs> it's like, it, it, and you can't sleep on watch. You get caught sleeping on watch, and that, in time of war, you could be shot. You could be put to death. Standing watch is is a very important thing. Like I said, sleeping on watch, you get caught, you get put to death. Well, Joe. And being watchful for his return is one thing, but then we're also told to watch for. Satan, who's there is a roaring lion waiting to see who he will he can devour. And so, yeah, we're not just watching for him to return, but also, you know, again, for the enemy, for somebody that can intrude and, and destroy us. Any other comments? You know, thinking about <clears throat> watching, it's it can be a little hard practically, well, okay, what am I actually supposed to do? You know, am I looking around? What am I actually looking for? And I think a helpful um, application of watchfulness, he talks about earlier in Luke 21, um, in verse 14, I don't know if this was covered maybe last week, but he says, settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer. He's talking about when they're going to be brought before kings and magistrates and they're going to bear witness. He says, settle it now, think about it now, and be convicted in your faith as to what you know and what you believe because if you wait until the opportunity arises to think about these things you're going to you're going to make a decision based on the the whims of the moment and it's not going to be firm and it's not going to be as founded in truth as if you thought about it ahead of time so um, kind of a practical way to be watchful it's we're not looking on the horizon for something to pop up and come towards us you know necessarily so it it's a way to think about how that watchfulness actually gets applied to us. And I think, I think that's, that's very true. I, I will tell you, Gail, they just didn't throw you out on watch, did they? When you, when you had to stand your watch, they just didn't throw you out there, did they? I know when I, when I went to stand watch, I was with another person, and they said, okay, this is what you have to do. In fact, out on the pier, we had a a little clock thing 
that we had to stick a key in that had a number on it that imprinted on, on a piece of paper and you had to do different times so that way they knew that you 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 went and walked up and down the pier and so <clears throat> but there were okay. there was things that we were trained on what you need to watch for if if something was to go on you were to call i mean this is this was in in 77 so 77 78 so i mean if a small boat came up to the pier if they were fishing and stuff we just we couldn't shoot it we could tell them to leave and then we could call the the petty officer of the watch and and they they might come down and shoo them off or whoever but the only time other than boot camp that i had a rifle in my hands was that night and it was loaded and i I tell you what, I was a scared puppy. I had one thing that helped, and that was a little shack there that would break the wind for you, but that was it. So you kept busy walking back and forth through, throughout the area of the pier that you uh, were assigned to. And there was no relief until that man come to relieve me of my duty. And you hope they didn't oversleep. Ah, uh, yes, and I was glad to see him. Okay, yeah, but <clears throat> I think kind of spinning off Andrew is that we need to train people how to watch. And one of the, I mean, that's, that's the reason why we have these words. If we read and see what we need to watch for. I mean, Christ here was, had given them the things to, to watch for with Jerusalem. He just didn't say, hey, you know, uh, in the future, this is going to happen, you know, just just kind of be ready. He kind of gave them some warning signs. And so he, he's kind of trained them, give them some training on, on what to watch for. And when we take a look in our life, how we conduct it, he's given us the train. This, this is our training manual, Jim. You, uh, you also see from the other side of this from from when the the uh, master comes and finds his his servants doing what they're supposed to be doing, it, the kind of joy that that gives the master of seeing that diligence. Uh, I had, I had a couple young men do some work. Uh, I'll, I'll say who they were: Grant and and uh, David. And they they were working. I told them what I needed done. Uh, they weren't working together. They were this at different times. But the point is, I, I had to leave, and I was gone for quite a while, and came back. And you know, I, I've I've seen slackers before. Uh, these two guys, they they worked at this, the particular job I had for them, so, like they were killing snakes, and so. They they were doing what uh, they would have done for me if I'd still been there watching them. I mean, they they really worked, and I mean it was commendable to them, uh, also to their parents for good work ethics. But but I think the 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 joy that I had of seeing them doing what I had asked them to do, even though I wasn't there, that that meant a lot. And, I mean, that, that's good on them. And that's how we need to be doing for the Lord. We don't know when he's coming back. We need, we need to be watchful. And, and actually, if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, that is kind of being watchful. That, I mean, we're not looking at the horizon for Christ. We know that he's coming back. But if we're doing what we need to be doing, then in a way that's being watchful, paying attention to the warnings. That, that were given. <clears throat> Any other comments on on the householder here? Okay, uh, Ashley's going to read Matthew 25 and verses 1 through 13, going into uh, kind of what Brace was uh, alluding to. Then the kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. 
When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us, and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not, you do not know the day nor the hour. Okay. So when we take a look at this, we find, we find uh, half were wise, half were foolish. And before we get into taking a look at, at the wise and the foolish, what do you think the lamps represent? And I, I know that, that it doesn't go, Christ doesn't come back through here and, and say, okay, the lamps represent this. But what do you think the lamps would represent? Joyce? When I read it, I thought that the lamps would represent what we have got, what we have added to our um, to our lives, um, if you will, your spiritual record. Okay. Uh, in doing the things that we needed to do, so we would feel prepared. When we take a look, any anything else? If we take a look in Revelation and we take a look at the first chapter 2 and 3, what do the lampstands represent to the church? Their faithfulness, right? They're, that's the light that, they, that, that, that glows, that shows. We're to be a candle, right? So we're, we're to, to show that light. So lamps are light, is, is the light that we show. So if the lamp is the light that we show, what would the oil represent? What is required for us to show our light? The word? Yes, you got to do the word. But, I mean, we have the word here, but our faith is what fuels our light, is, is it not? With, with you know, uh, um, by my works I'll show my faith. And that faith is, 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 is a light to be shown. How can I show you my faith? How can you see my faith if it's not by the works that I do? So... If we take a look at the lamp being the light, we take a look at the oil, because oil fuels the light. If the oil is our faith, what is the fallacy of, of, the, of the unwise or the foolish five saying, share your oil? Can we share our oil with somebody else? You can't be your mom or dad's or, you know, it's, it's, you have got to know the word and that is what has got to strengthen your faith. So your, the faith that you have, Chuck, Jonathan and Grant cannot ride on that. Same thing with Susan. She can't ride on the faith that you, that you have. That's an example to them that they can try to follow but you can't share here, here, have some of my faith. And so when we take a look at here, you know, you might think that, man, aren't these five wise virgins, aren't they kind of stingy? Would you think that if, hey, share what you have with us so that we can all uh, have, have oil? Were they stingy saying, hey, you know, I, if, if I share, I may not have enough for me. Isn't that what the world would say? You have enough. 
Why, you have too much food. You need to give some to me. And in this whole thing of uh, redistribution and stuff, these all 10 of them probably would have been lost. But, again, if, if you take a look at the lamps representing light, the oil representing faith, even if, even if the five uh, wise wanted to share, you can't share your faith. You can help encourage. You can help give the example. But when it comes right down to it, you can't give it to them. Jim, what did you say? The wise, the wise virgins <clears throat> were prepared to wait, and the foolish weren't. And that's that's basically what it boils down to. Uh, by by preparing, you you do all those things that are necessary to put you in that position. Do you think that the foolish thought that they were prepared I'm when they sorry? first got there? When they first got there, yeah, but they they you know adversity or whatever comes up is they they weren't prepared for the long haul. Andrew, because it says the bridegroom was delayed, all of the virgins were prepared for what they thought the expected time would be. Right, it was only the ones who went further and prepared <clears throat> more than the more than the minimum expectation. They were the ones that remained prepared when the unexpected happened. Yes, they did. And so, go ahead, Bruce. I appreciate the point that you made just a minute ago because the reality is parables a lot of times get pressed to mean things they don't mean. And we've got to be careful that we understand the point Jesus is making. And, I mean, yes, on the surface we could look at it and say, wow, they were really selfish, they didn't share. We're supposed to share as Christians, but that's not the point of the parable. And people will do that in the world, and they will use parables or stories that sound logical and make a lot of sense. But the reality is they're comparing apples to oranges. It's, it's not a biblical application of the parable or the story. And so we've got to be really discerning in the way that we listen to things and make sure that what's being said is what Jesus was saying and what the Word of God is saying. And so we, we just have to be really careful to listen because people will, people are really crafty in using words to make good logical sense. Um, I give you an example. There are denominations that will say, he who gets on the bus and sits down, according to the way that we read Matthew or Mark 16, 15, and 16, he who gets on the bus and sits down will make it to New York. And they said, that's the way we read Mark 16, 15, and 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And they will say, the reality is he who gets on the bus will make it to New York whether he sits down or not. And so all you have to do is believe. And on the surface, it sounds logical, and it makes good sense. But it's comparing apples to oranges. That's Jesus was saying, we have to do both. So we need to come up with a different illustration. The bus illustration doesn't work. Yes, you can stand on the bus and still make it to New York. Or Not you if can the driver out. won't drive until everyone's seated. And so, I mean, there has to be, we have to, we have to make a story or a parable right. that fits the language that Jesus is using. We can't just use our own reasoning and logic and come up with a story that we think makes sense. And suddenly we proved a point. Jesus was, he was just, made, belief is enough. No, that's not Jesus' point, and that's pretty clear when you look at the rest of the, the New Testament. Right. Um, and so the problem is not with what Jesus said or with our application of what Jesus said. The problem is with the story. It, it, it doesn't fit. They're, they're not comparing the same things. And so we've got to be able to listen and to discern and to make sense of Jesus' words. And then we may want to come up with an illustration. Greg's really good at that. He's, he's able to take a story and illustrate a spiritual point, but he's very discerning in the story that he uses to make sure that it fits what the Bible is actually teaching and is not trying to make some other point that the Bible has and doesn't have in mind. And so that's what we've got to be careful about. Absolutely. Stories can mean whatever you want them to mean, but they may not mean what the Bible means. Right. And that's what we're after, is what is God saying to us 
and what does God want from us? So. Gail? Something. My wife has asked me to read this because she wrote it down. So anybody that talks to my wife can say, yes, he did read it. <laughs> <laughs> she has here an application or of the answer. What will happen if we don't put the kingdom of God first? What will happen if we are not prepared to meet God? Christians cannot follow Christ from afar. They can't engage in questionable pleasure or be worldly-minded and be prepared to meet God. Christians must properly prepare with prayer, Bible study, helping those in need, giving, and remember the Lord's death until he comes again. Always be ready to defend our faith. He wrote this, she wrote this just above there, and I, I think this applied. The future of those who are unprepared to meet their God. On the day of the Lord's return, it will be too late to make up for one's lack or neglect of proper pre preparation. And when I was reading this last night, I got to thinking this is, this is a terrible thing to see or to study. Both of these groups were invited by the bridegroom to attend this marriage. One group prepared for it. The other group was not prepared. They were not interested enough to make preparation to be there when the bridegroom comes back. Okay, so my question is, because I don't know that they weren't interested enough. And, and let me kind of explain. What, what do you think... Do you think that they all thought that they were prepared enough? If if the oil is their faith, what were they doing after, when they got there to the door? What did they go and do? D they slept, right? Now, if if you're worried about things, are you going to sleep? Probably not. If you're concerned about things going on, if you're concerned about what's going to happen, do I have, an, do I have enough? They probably wouldn't, would not have been sleeping with, with, you know, at the same time that the, the wise were. So I think, think both groups, you have the foolish. They, they all went there thinking, we have enough. The bridegroom was delayed, as, as Andrew said. There was five of them that had enough faith to carry through that. The other five didn't. What stands in our way as far as our faith? Do we all come, at, when, we, when we put on Christ, and I, I really think God's talking about, or Jesus is talking maybe to the apostles themselves, but disciples certainly. Do all the disciples, do all the apostles have the faith that is required at this time? Some growth. And they absolutely and, do. And, they, and Christ will take care of that. But did Peter think that he had the faith? <laughs> yes, did he, he think did. that he had enough oil? He, he had a lot of different thoughts, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that there are times that we as Christians, we may think that, hey, we've got it made. And certainly if we're young Christians, we may think, hey, I'm going strong, going strong. And that may be great, you know, as teenagers, as when we're in our 20s. But by the time we hit our 30s and 40s, man, we've been hit with this and hit with that. We've had, had this obstacle, that obstacle, e even those going to college. I mean, it's got to be tough in college because there's a lot of people there that, that think you guys are foolish for, for even believing in God. And there's professors there that if you're writing papers and stuff, that if, if you decide to write on faith, that you're probably not going to get a good grade. 
Ashley? <clears throat> well, you asked what some of the obstacles are, and I was just thinking when we have faith in the wrong thing, I think that that's a huge obstacle because, you know, when we have faith in um, other Christians, when we have faith in, you know, the preacher or the elders, when our faith is based on the wrong thing, then we're going to be severely disappointed and grow weary and, you know, lose our faith. So we just need to make sure that our faith is in the one who deserves it. Absolutely. So we're getting ready to hit the bell. Thank you for for all the the, the conversation, for all the, the comments. Uh, we'll, we'll finish this with the 10 virgins, and maybe we'll finish uh, 44. I think Sunday... Grace will be taking the class next Sunday. Uh, I'll be going to the teenage class. On Wednesday, I will have um, the, the criteria, uh, some, some handouts for the teenage class. So thank you so much. Thank you, Hannah, for...